everyone and welcome to the GSM's Pride Spotlight. This week I have Jerry Paul. Say hello, Jerry. Hello. Don't say hello, Jerry. So I have to give a <laughs> disclaimer before we start. Jerry and I have a great relationship. However, he has a hard time hearing. It's not because he's deaf, it's because he doesn't understand me. So just bear in mind there may be a little bit of a time delay with, with the answer. Is that correct, Jerry? That is correct. I, I, uh, I can hear you. I just can't understand what you're saying, but I applaud you for trying to learn the English language. So let's talk about that real quick. You've always given me a lot of crap since I've been here saying that I don't speak the Queen's English. <laughs> but in fact, I do speak the Queen's English and you speak the American English. Thanks for trying. You're, you're, a, you're a, a, a man of the world, correct, Jerry? Kind of. You've, been, you've toured the world. I've been a few places. You've been a few places. Yep. So let's, ju let's jump back a little bit. Um, you were born and bred St. Louis, correct? I was, I, was, I was born in Afton and moved to Fenton, and then when I was a young man, probably in the seventh grade, I moved to South St. Louis, down, downtown by Targo okay. Park. Went to Roosevelt High School, and uh, then I got, went in the military, the Army, for three years. Okay. And um, when I got, but prior to that, I had got a job with Delta Airlines at the airport. I was a baggage handler. And um, then I got drafted, so I had to go in the Army, and my job was held for me, so I still had it when I got back. So where did you, where did you, how many tours did you do with the Army? Uh, three years. And where did you go? Went, I went, um, it's a long story, which I won't tr get into, but uh, I was trained at Aber Aberdeen Proving Grounds, Maryland, to be a uh, aircraft armament repairman. And then they sent me to Korea, where the war was Vietnam, and all the, all the Huey helicopters, which is what I would have put the armament on were there so there was nothing for me to do and I never did learn never did put a armament on anything <laughs> <laughs> so did, did you did you fight at all in nope. Korea in Korea nope. or not the only, so you were more a mechanic kind of no I was uh, they made me a supply clerk, clerk and then I was the battalion commander's driver so uh, you know the lieutenant colonel was the hierarchy of the of the post, and I was just driving him around in a jeep. That was okay. my job. But, so you did kind of risk your life a little bit. But um, we had maybe 24 hours of uh, possible combat that never happened. But uh, the North Koreans stole a ship of ours back in uh, in the 60s called the Pueblo, and they still have it, and they have it on display in North Korea. Really? And uh, they, at the same time, they came down to uh, assassinate President Park, and they just made one mess out of another and were unsuccessful, but I was right in the middle of that little thing for one day. Cool. That was it. That so was what, it. what year did you come back to the U.S.? Um, I went in the Army in 1967 and got out in January of 1970. And then you went back to Delta? Delta, back to Delta. Okay, and what did you do then for Delta? Well, I went back to the baggage handling, and then um, the first eight years, I, were, I worked for Delta for 18 years. The first eight years, I was a baggage handler, and the last 10 years, I was a public contact person. So I worked at the ticket counter and the gate, and um, it was called customer service. So, and we won't get into it, because I'm sure it would take a long time, but you have a lot of stories about that. A lot of stories. I've heard a lot of them, yeah. I'm just saying. Yeah. It, it will do a special on Jerry a little later <laughs> and we'll go through all his stories. So then what year did you get in the car business? Um, well, I'd, I left uh, Delta in 1984. And I'm gonna just touch on a couple other things that I did. And the first thing I did, um, I had met Lou Brock, the baseball player, um, who just passed away. Uh, because he was a frequent flyer on Delta, and when he found out I didn't work there anymore, he hired me to manage. He had two stores in the airport, and he wanted me to manage them because I was familiar with airline travelers and so forth and so on. And I worked, uh, um, I worked for him for a year, and then I left that, and I taught at a uh, airline academy people that wanted to work for travel agents or they wanted to work for airlines, um, they went through this class and I was the inst head instructor hmm. and uh, did that for a year. 
And then this was the funny thing. I answered an ad. I just all the my all the people that uh, were frequent flyers, the business people were salespeople, and um, they seemed successful. And I thought, well, if I've got to try a new uh, vocation, I might as well. I think I'd like to get into sales. And I answered an ad from Gene Fuse Nissan, which Gene is Lou's brother, and it was on uh, Manchester and 141. And the ad said, and I will quote. We will train you in the exciting career of automobile sales. Please call Mike Gavin, 227-2200. Uh, I called that number. I was hired over the telephone, okay? And the training was, here's, there's the cars, and here come the people. That was the entire training. <laughs> <laughs> so old school training then. Yeah, so I went uh, home after one day and told my wife that, uh, um, what had, what had happened and what, what idiots I thought they might be. But I met them all and I didn't think any of them were any smarter than I was, so I'll teach myself to do it. And I that's what I did. And you've been in the car business how long, John? I've been with... Uh, with, with Fuse. With Fuse for um, like 32, 33 years. Well, thank you for your service in both regards. Well, thank you. The Army and the... Yeah, uh, I appreciate that. So I want to I wanna bounce back. Uh, we'll bounce back and forth. I want to touch on something real quick. So... Um, when we had Chris as a general manager, mm -hmm. um, you came to me just before Chris passed and said that you were going to retire. Isn't that correct, Jerry? Correct. But we're going to talk about a little bit what happened there. Right. So uh, let, let's talk about that. What, what made you not retire, Jerry? Well, I never wanted to retire. There are people that uh, spend their whole life wake, working that I've known that all they think about is retirement. <clears throat> Excuse me. I used to think about retirement and think, well, that'll be pretty much fun. And then as I got closer to it, you think, I don't really have any hobbies. I don't know what I would do with myself, and I would go crazy. My hobby is talking to people. I've been ta I, 18 years at Delta, 32 years with Fuse. Every day I get up, I leave my house, and I go talk to strangers. I enjoy talking to strangers more than I enjoy talking to family members. I know anything, everything about them. I don't have anything to ask them that's new. Uh, I'm in the car business. Every once in a while, one of them, a family member will say, hey, I just bought a new car. You want to look at it? And I say, no. I don't care anything about cars. I just like people, you know? And uh, they look at me like I'm crazy, but um, it's just, it's, it's a situation that I don't know what I would do with myself. So as long as I have my mental facilities, faculties, and my health is okay, then I enjoy, I enjoy getting up and having a place to go every day. So I'm going to touch on that real quick. So Jerry came to me and said, I'm, I, I think it's time for me to retire. And I basically said to Jerry, that's not going to happen um, in so many shape or form. Well, I actually spoke to... Randy Fuse, the president of the company, and told him that Jerry was thinking about retiring. Obviously, Jerry's been with us for 32 years, so uh, he wanted to find a place for him in some way, shape, or form. So we, we created a position for Jerry, and that's worked out well. But um, my point to this is, you know, I asked the question to Jerry was, do you want to retire? And he said, no, I don't necessarily want to, but I don't really know. I don't want to sell cars necessarily every single day. Um, so... The good thing about the Fuse organization is that they are willing to keep loyal people and figure out a way to place them in. So um, we'll bounce back real fast. <clears throat> so you start off with Gene Fuse. Mm -hmm. um, and what you were just a salesperson at uh, the Nissan store? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I was. And um, I got to put the pieces back together. But within a year, Gene Fuse, was in, Gene Fuse the person, was in the middle of a divorce, and Lou Fuse was managing, Lou Fuse Jr. was managing the store. Gene had no active role in it, and it was a bitter divorce, and uh, one side was trying to prove the dealership was profitable, and the other side was trying to prove that they weren't profitable, so there was no advertising or anything like that. And so it was, it was a strange situation, but we all knew eventually it was gonna close. And so within a year, I uh, became very close with my general manager 
and he needed somebody. He had, he had found his uh, F&I manager wasn't doing things the way he should have, and he just needed somebody that he could trust, so he put me in there to fill in for that. And, and what I, brand was that? That was Nissan still. Nissan still. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, I did that for about a year, and then they closed the dealership, and they transferred us to Lou Fuse Nissan. And my, my general manager, Mike Garrison, was the general manager over at Lufuse Nissan now. And um, once again, I did the, um, I went to sales and then he asked, he had the same situation, so he needed me as F&I, so I did that. And then, then you got moved up to a used car manager spot. Well, that wasn't at Nissan. No, but that was at And Saturn. I'll tell you how I ended up getting that, that job. Um, when they open up Saturn, <clears throat> I told, no, I told Mike Garrison that if the salesman, if the new car sales manager job ever opened up, I wanted that job. And he told me, I promise you, you will get it. And so then six months, eight months goes past, the sales manager's gone, and he um, came, called me in his office, and he says, I'm filling the, the sales manager's position, and I'm not giving you the job. And I said, what are you talking about? And he says, whoever gets that job is going to get fired, and I don't want you to have that job. And uh, I said, well, I says, then I want to go to Saturn. They just opened up Saturn. So he arranged for me to go to Saturn. I was a sales there, and um, then I worked for Dan Fuse, and within a year, then I was the used car manager at Saturn for um, six years. I, I was there a total of eight years, so. So what year did you come to Ford? 2000. Was that after Saturn? Hmm? Was that after Saturn? Was that after what? Saturn. After the yeah. Saturn dealership? Yeah, that was, well, it, I was still at Saturn, and um, little by little, Dan had five Saturn stores, and little by little, he had uh, figured out that that he could run the stores without a used car manager. And I was the only used car manager left. And uh, I knew that me and him hardly ever agreed. And, and I knew that sooner or later he was gonna get rid of my spot. So after six years of being a used car manager there, um, he told me that he was gonna get rid of my position. And, and I could go back into sales. And I said, well, let me think about it. And so then I asked, Randy Harmon was uh, the used car manager over here, and we were always really good friends, and I called him. And I knew they were building a new store here, and Chesterfield Valley was building up, and I thought this would be a much better place than Saturn, which was going downhill, and go, to, was coming up. go, go to a new store that was hopefully gonna go uphill. And so I came here, and this is a funny thing, I had not actually sold any cars for six years, and we were in the old building down there, which was really a disgrace. It was, yeah. it was such a small little place. You could, hear, you could hear everything anybody said in the whole showroom. So um, it was just, it, it wasn't a good situation. But I started one day and told everybody there that I wasn't going to sit down until I sold a car. And it took me three days, and I was standing at the door waiting for every customer to come in. And they all looked at me like I was nuts, and my legs were hurting, my ankles were hurting, and, and I was salesman of the month that m month. And so that was how that started, so. And you, you've you been at the Ford store f since 1990, you said, right? No, since 2000. 2000, so yeah. 21, 21 years, years. Yeah. jeez Louise. Yep. Um, what uh, what made you stay at Ford specifically? I don't really. I don't. Never gave it much thought. Um, I. It's one of the things where you you think about it, and as you're here, I think. Well, if I, you know, through the 21 years, there have been a little bit of craziness here and there, and you think, well. I could go to a different store, but I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to sell a competitor's product, because I truly believe that Ford makes the best truck, and, it, and you, you sell what you believe in, and yeah. I don't know that 
there are salesmen that sell things they don't believe in, but I've never been that guy. I'm the honest talker. You know, if I tell you something, it's truthful. Trust um, me, I know. <laughs> and um, so I, I don't know that I would would have ever left if they asked me to. You know, I don't know. I I guess if I wasn't here at Ford. I would probably be out of the car business. Are well, you here? Yeah, I'm here. Um, let's touch on something. Like I said, uh, when we first started, we we're gonna have to kind of speed through this because Jerry's obviously had a long career in the industry, and <laughs> it would take us a lot longer than uh, 20 minutes that we've got ready to to spend. Um, what differences are now versus when you first come to the store? Night and day. I mean, the, it goes back to what I told you, what the training was. There's the cars and here comes the people. And basically, I, I, on my own, I had to go out and learn every car. They were Nissan, so I had to <clears throat> learn about every single car they had. And then the way I learned the people was because I had 18 years of experience in talking to people. Every time I had a customer, and I tell, when you hire somebody new, if they are smart enough to come in and talk to me, not all, all of them are, but if they are, I tell them the same, every one of them the same thing. If you wait on a customer when you're new, when the customer leaves, sit down and have a conversation with yourself. Now, what did I say to that customer that really went over and she, the sheer he accepted? And what did I say that maybe they didn't accept? And get rid of the stuff that didn't work and hang on to the stuff that does work. And um, I ask every single customer when I was new, Tell me everything you hate about the car business. Now, I think back in uh, 1987, that was my first year, there was a lot more people. I was selling, I was a car salesman, people didn't like car salesmen, and I was a Nissan car salesman, so I was selling Japanese cars, so I was a two-time loser, you know. And so I asked every person that came in, um, Tell me everything you hate about the car business. Or the, no, tell not everything. That would take forever. Tell me the number one thing you hate about the car business. And whatever they told me, I would put it in a list and I wouldn't do it. You know, that's how I learned and taught myself what to do. Um, you know, one of the funny things I always remember from coming in is the, there was a big joke uh, car salesman, car managers, the uh, customers. Buyers are liars, and I kind of figured it out real fast that the people working at the dealership did a lot more lying than the customers did. You know, that's just the way it was back there, and um, so it, I I can tell you that the entire time I sold cars, I never once lied to a customer about anything ever, and because it comes back to haunt you. Oh, absolutely, and that's and that's how you've really. Being able to stay in the car, the car industry as long as you are, because you know you are, there's a lot of people, especially that I've worked with, and I'm sure yourself, that are always running away from the comebacks. Basically, right, is what right. they're doing. Um, let, let's t we don't have much more, much time, so I want to touch on a couple of things. Um, what was it like when I first came over here? Because obviously, I'm very different to the stereotypical car business. Um, what w what was that like transitioning to a kind of a different mindset? Well, um, I don't want you to, your head to get more inflated than it is, but um, you know, I t I'm a pretty good judge of character, I think, and the st say stuff you say you and, and do demonstrates to me that you feel the, exactly the same way, for the most part, about um, how the business should be run. And I hate to say this, but I've worked with some managers over the years that uh, I didn't agree with anything they did, you know. And, um, you know, the one thing I can tell you, it, there's nothing worse than being a car salesman. and. Um, when your manager browbeats you to death and you're the one sitting in a room that needs needs to make sell a car so you can make a living so you can buy some Christmas presents 
and the other one's got some sort of a guaranteed salary where you got nothing. And so who wants to sell cars the most, the salesmen or the managers? And, and it was just never came across a lot of times from people that way. So it, uh, it, when you got here, I, within a week or two, I told you that, uh, um, you know, I, I could recognize that you, your head was in the right place. And when Chris got the general manager job, I sat down and told Chris that if they would have asked me, I would have recommended you. But I said, it's just like an election. Chris, you're my president now, so I'll follow you. And uh, you, I got your back. So that's the way it works. Yep. Um, let's just address something real fast. What day are you born on, Jerry? Christmas Eve. And what do you do every single Christmas Eve? Don't work. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason why you touch on that is the very first day I came here, um, I became I was a general sales manager, acting GM or whatever you wanted to call me back then. But um, so Jerry comes up to me, introduces himself, and it was actually kind of funny because before I came out here, everybody already had somewhat told me each individual what I was going to get with everyone. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I'm going to say this right now for those people. Majority of you were dead wrong, <laughs> but I'm just gonna, just just saying. Um, and Jerry came up to me and said, "I just want you to know something because I I came up in October. Um, I don't ever work my birthday in this Christmas <laughs> Eve, just so you know. So that was uh, my, really one of my first interactions, which I will never forget with Jerry. It was kind of funny that he told me he was born on Christmas Eve and he's never worked it. So that was uh, mm -hmm. so. Needless to say, you've never worked it. Never. Mm -mm. I've always let you have it. Well, when I worked at Delta, I had to. Yeah. You know, you worked on Christmas Day and New Year's Day and. Thanksgiving, it's a whole different world. But. How'd you like your new role, Jerry? Hmm? How'd you like your new role? I like it. You know, it, it's pretty similar to my old role as a used car manager. Um, I never did like the term manager. I told you that. Yeah, even though he's my inventory manager, he still never likes me to call him the inventory manager. The, um, see, in my opinion, a manager is somebody they let manage. And, and, a, and in reality, a manager is somebody that does what the higher up manager tells them to do. That kind of happens. Huh? Kind of happens. Yeah. All right, Jerry, that's about all I've got. Well, that's Have a, you got anything that you want to say to the people at home? I can't think. I can talk forever, you know that, but uh, I don't know that I have anything else. Well, I didn't answer your question what the differences was. Oh, okay. Um, I went off on a little side trip. Uh, the differences then, you came into work, you had your hand on the phone, and you looked out the window for a customer. Now customers come in and ask for somebody. And so now now everybody's got get their head in the computer doing all these tasks and taking videos and so forth and so on. Um, the only problem with it is if somebody pulls up, everybody's got their head in the computer and they might not see the customer. Then there's somebody yelling front door. <laughs> and But it's uh, you couldn't make a living staring out the window anymore, I don't think. No, absolutely not. Well, thanks for joining me, Jerry. I appreciate it. I'm sure we'll probably visit again because, like I said, we could probably go on for yeah. hours with you, with you. But as always, over at Lufus Ford, we can replace the car, not the customer. And I'll see you all next week.